Jesus made a big deal about recognizing that the signs and wonders were not the point of what he was doing there. He wasn't there to be showy. He didn't want to get big crowds and show off and make a name for himself in that way. He was trying to point to the fact that he had a bigger purpose in mind. The salvation of humanity was a bigger deal than whether or not you were impressed by the latest flashy thing he did. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Today, yeah, like uh, Pastor Mandy said, we get to talk about um, Jesus' first miracle, and it happened at a wedding. Weddings are fun, huh? Anybody? Um, I like... I like weddings. Weddings are neat because um, uh, some of the time I get to perform the wedding, and, you know, like officiate, and that's, that's kind of fun. But um, more than that, there's so much hope. There's so much rich symbolism and, um, and, and meaning and, and purpose to everything that happens in a wedding. You know, like there's, there's meaning behind... You know, there, there's supposed to be meaning behind the white dress. There's supposed to be meaning behind the um, the rings and the the phrases that are used, and all of these things. Everything has symbolism. All these things are signs of other deeper commitments in life, right? And it's not all about the wedding. And then, like, all right, well, that was cool. Like, see you later, I guess, or never. And walk away, and I mean, like you know, that probably happens in Vegas, I guess, with those drive-through chapels. But uh, the the point of the wedding is not meant to be just a like, hi, all right, that was fun, we looked cool for a minute, got some nice photos, and then you know, I'll talk to you in a few years or something, right? It's it's supposed to be the beginning and foundation of a significant lifelong, uh, you know, joining to becoming one flesh, two be- two lives becoming one life, um, two. Uh, hearts being knit together in eternal and important ways. And so, um, you know, there's all the things that happen at the wedding and even, you know, this ongoing sign of the wedding ring, you know, that um, you're supposed to wear as a sign that like, hey, hello, I'm, I'm attached to somebody else. Like my life is not my own. It, it's connected to, it's permanently joined to this other person and this unending circle is, you know, supposed to be the, the eternal sign of like, you know, there's no beginning and end. The circle just keeps going around. And those are important things. But like when, when Mandy and I got married, we did a lot of, uh, you know, we had some symbolic things in there, right? We did all the things that you normally do. And, uh, and we gave each other rings. And, um, and the rings are cool. But like I didn't get married so that I could have this little piece of metal around my finger, right? Like this wasn't the point. This is neat. I like it. It's fancy. This is my second one. Not my second marriage. Second ring. Um, I foolishly thought, you know, when would I ever take this off? Why would I ever take this thing off? Um, turns out whitewater rafting, that's a good time to take it off. Um, went whitewater rafting a couple years into our marriage. And um, I'd been wearing a glove. And so I thought, like, yeah, it's safe there. But uh, they only had a limited number of gloves. And a fewer gloves than people. And so at one point, I had been, you know, I was sitting in the front. And when you sit in the front of a raft, if you've ever been whitewater rafting, you may know this. But if you sit in the front seats, um, there's kind of two rows. So everyone's paddling on both sides, right? Or everyone's paddling on their side. And if you're in the front, there's a lot of, like, helping steer and paddling kind of sideways. And so they were like, hey, make sure the guys in front have a glove on their, like, bottom hand. And so I was on the left side. So as I'm pedaling this way, there was a lot of like scrape your hand on the, on the raft. And so I was like, ooh, you know, like need the protection for the knuckles there. And so I got the glove on my left hand, but not on the right one. It was very Michael Jackson, you know, and doing that. And the people that my buddy on the other side, he wore the other gloves so he could do the same thing on, you know, without scraping his hand too much. Well, um, we switched spots for the next round, but we didn't switch gloves. I didn't think about that. And so I had a glove on my uh, or, uh, I mean, we switched spots and we switched gloves. And so I, you know, now I have the glove on my right hand and I'm going and we're doing the thing. And about 20 yards into it, we go up to a, a more intense rapid. And they said, you know, like if we start tipping, then we'll cl- call high side and everyone lean to the side that's going up so that because if you just stay straight, 
we will all flip upside down. And that's not where you want to be, especially not in the rapids we were going into. There's the class four rapids and like kind of more stuff and bigger and, you know, the rocks are more intense and the water's more intense and it's fun if you stay in the raft. And <laughs> we started to high side and so we dipped down up, up against this rock and so everyone's, you know, leaning this way and then it switched real fast. And we went like from what looked like we were about to go like upside down onto a rock. We kind of, as everyone high sided this way, we flipped and we went up onto the rock and I didn't correct fast enough and I stayed leaning over. And when we shot up like this, I landed on my friend to the left of me and then I bounced down the river. And Mandy was right behind me. She won't go whitewater rafting anymore. Um, cause she was like, we were going, I was doing the thing. We went up against a rock and then you weren't there anymore. <laughs> and it took about 20 minutes for them to catch up to me. So it, uh, she was without me for a while. And it was a long time before they could see me. Cause I shot down the rapids out of the boat and, uh, came close to drowning a bunch of times. I more than once stopped like under a small waterfall and, you know, just like being waterboarded by the river and, uh, <laughs> called out to the Lord, like, is this it? Is this the moment? Is this when I die? I held on to the stupid oar, um, but at one point I managed to lose my wedding ring. So somewhere in the Kern River in Southern California, if you ever see a shiny silver thing that looks like this, it might be mine. Um, it's in there somewhere. But the thing is, I lost my ring in a, in a river, and I didn't lose my marriage in the river. I didn't lose my life in the river, uh, and... Despite losing the ring, Mandy let me get back in the raft, and uh, I told her, I was like, I'm so sorry, I lost my ring, like I'm still choking up river water and, you know, coughing out, and, and she goes, I don't care, get back in the raft. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, so it's a, it's a cool sign that I'm married, but it's not the whole marriage by any means. It points to the fact that I am married to Mandy, and it's got some good scuffs and marks and things. And at first, I was like, you know, that first one, you're like, no. Then after a while, it's like, oh, it's kind of cool, you know, battle scars. Like, we've been through some <laughs> stuff, you know. Um, but this isn't the thing. Like, I'm still married. I didn't get married for this. Signs are important. They show, they point to things. They show us the way to stuff, but signs are not our destination. Um, despite, you know, like sometimes on social media, like, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those who likes to, you know, like we went to Yellowstone and I'm like, look, the sign. And we like took a photo next to it. Like we were really here, you know, and like a couple times when we would go to Tahoe, we'd stop at the one over by the Lake Tahoe airport and, you know, made everybody get out and climb the rocks and like, look, we're in Tahoe. And, you know, those kind of things. Like I like to take the picture near the sign, but like the sign is cool because of, where it identifies that we are, right? Or where we're headed to. You know, the signs are neat as we're driving down the road, like, oh, look, it's only this much farther. I took a long road trip uh, this week, and, um, you know, it was about six and a half hours there and back uh, each way. And, um, and, you know, as we're going, like, oh, look, it's only this much longer, and then we're there. And, and like, that's, you know, those signs are exciting, but we didn't stop at the sign and go, ah, finally, I got to the sign. Right? We, we stopped, or we kept going because the signs are pointing us in the direction, confirming that we're on our way. They're letting us know that this is the way to go to get to that. And so as we get into this thing and as we get into discussing miracles, um, talking about signs in this way is really important because when John talks about miracles, he hardly ever uses the words that the other gospel writers use. He rarely uses the word miracle. Um, he, that we translate as miracle. He, ra he rarely uses even, um, you know, signs and wonders. Like he hardly ever uses this thing for like these miraculous events. He talks about them as signs and he specifically curates the history that he has with Jesus as he writes this down to present a few very specific, very intentional signs that point the way to know Jesus Christ as Lord. He's not just going, man, I've seen cool stuff. He's going, I have walked with the living God. And I want you to believe in him. I want you to know him. And so as we read this, the, the whole intent of his telling of this is, is focused on that. 
We're in John 2, so if you, if you have your Bible and you want to open it, or if you're in the notes on the digital version there, uh, do that. <clears throat> I'm going to read the first 12 verses. It goes like this. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to his servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone, bring out the choice wine. everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine later after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. And what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and there they stayed for a few days. So this is just a brief moment. Jesus stops by, but this is the first sign with the disciples. And what's he do? He throws a party. He keeps the party going. But it was a sign. It wasn't about the party. It wasn't about the miracle. It was about who he is. And it's the first time that he revealed his glory. This whole event is a sign pointing to Jesus. In John 20, John lays out, I I read this a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to keep coming back to it because this is why we're reading the Gospel of John. This is why the Gospel of John exists. Why was this here? Why is it written the way that it is? Well, it wasn't to be a perfect biography chronological chronological account of every moment of Jesus' day. It's not a di- daily diary, you know, a di- uh, you know, three years in the life of a disciple. This is all arranged and presented to say, this guy who walked with us and ate with us and taught us and did these incredible things, everything he did and said, every wonderful thing that people saw, it's not Jesus the hippie, the nice guy. It's not Jesus the angry revolutionary. It, it's not Jesus the really wise teacher. It's the Son of God himself come down in flesh, the incarnation, God in meat, God in flesh, God as a human walking the earth, to yes, teach, to yes, heal and and do miraculous, wonderful things. And it all points back to by relationship with him, by faith in him, we would have eternal life. And then to make the way for that possible to also be the perfect ultimate sacrifice that he's the only one worthy and qualified to actually provide a sacrifice that would cover all of our sin for any who would place faith in him, they would have eternal life. And this is why John wrote his gospel. John 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. He acknowledges, these aren't the only signs. Don't read this and go, oh man, John only presents like seven significant signs of Jesus, so he must have only done those. That is an ignorant way to read the Bible, to go, the only things that ever happened are what are exactly recorded in these pages. That, that is a, a misinformed way of reading the Bible. To, to read that and, and, and any of the, go, the Gospels and think, oh, well, these things don't exactly line up or it's in this one and not in that one, therefore it can't be real or any of those kinds of things. All sorts of weird ideas people come up with. Well, how come it's not in all of these? Seems like a significant moment. Yeah, there were a million significant moments, and to everybody that encountered Jesus, that was probably the biggest day of their life. And there were probably people who were still alive, who had seen and encountered Jesus, who they didn't get their story of healing into the gospel. And they hear the gospel later, and they go, but, but where's mine? Well, keep telling that story too, but this is the one that this guy wrote down. This is the way he wrote it so that people would know, so that they would see he's building a particular case to show not that he's making stuff up, 
Not that he's cutting things out that should have been in there, but just this is what each of them presented. But John openly acknowledges there's so much more that happened that I don't have time to write. But these ones are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These things, there were so many more signs that Jesus did, but these ones were written down so that you may believe that Jesus is Messiah and that by believing in him, you would have eternal life. The signs are not the destination. Signs merely point the way to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so it's important for us to read and understand the signs, to know what they're pointing at. I, um, I spent a semester abroad in Spain a long, long time ago, and at a couple of times I took some trips farther north than I was. I was in kind of north-central Spain, um, in the central Castilla-Leon region, but I went up into Basque country several times, and Basque is a uh, a different part of Spain. And, and there's several Basque restaurants and stuff. There's some Basque heritage in our uh, area, actually. But um, it, it's not Spanish. The, their signs, all of a sudden, like everything looked like it was in a, a different, different language. You know, coming from America, I don't speak very good Spanish. I took several years of it in middle school and high school and college and got there and was like, oh, geez, now I have to learn how to talk it. That, that wasn't a part of what they teach you in school. They, they're not concerned with learning how to speak it. They want you to pass grammar tests. Um, so I knew how to conjugate a bunch of verbs that I never used in tenses that literally no one cared about ever. Um, <laughs> but I learned how to speak while I was there. And I learned how to read signs pretty good. And then we went to Basque country and I was all sorts of lost. And then I went to Portugal and same thing happened. I'm like, this looks like Spanish. It doesn't sound like it though. Uh, <laughs> And then, and then they use the weird French C thing with the dangly part underneath. It's like the G broke and fell under. What is it? I still, I, there's a name for that letter. I don't know what it is. Uh, I never took French and I never really learned Portuguese very well. So, um, but signs only, signs only count if you can figure out what they're supposed to say and what they're po- supposed to point you at. And if you can't understand what the sign says, it doesn't matter that the sign's there. If I were to go to Russia, I'd be completely lost. I can't even sound that stuff out. Or any um, Oriental Asian country, like if, if I saw a bunch of signs in Chinese, there's no way. Like I can't even start to figure out, like they said it's this. I don't know how to make sounds out of those things. They're a bunch of shapes. And draw, like, I can't make sense of that. I don't know how to read that. Those signs wouldn't do me any good. I'd have to have somebody translate them for me or or point the way. And so um, these things, the signs, um, point us to Jesus, but only if we understand them. And it's really important. Jesus made a big deal about recognizing that the signs and wonders were not the point of what he was doing there. He wasn't there to be showy. He didn't want to get big crowds and show off and make a name for himself in that way. He was trying to point to the fact that he had a bigger purpose in mind. The salvation of humanity was a bigger deal than whether or not you were impressed by the latest flashy thing he did. In Luke 10, the disciples get a, a taste of that. They get, they get that clarification. He says, um, it, he sends out 72 of them, equips them, and they go and do wonderful, amazing things. They're casting out demons. They're healing people, like all this stuff. The 72 returned, is Luke, Luke 10, verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Hey, we're just saying that. Uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you in that moment. That's not like a permanent thing. Don't go playing with snakes. Those are bad for you. Um, And scorpions hurt, man. Uh, However, he says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. The signs are not the destination. The signs point the way to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. The thing to rejoice in is knowing him, having your name recorded in heaven, being eternally adopted into the family of the Lord, not, whoa, look at this thing. But 
The signs are important. I didn't just go like, well, I lost this in the river. Forget about it. No, no, no. I still want this. I still want one of these on my finger. I even, while I took the opportunity while I didn't have a ring to wear to, I got Mandy's initial tattooed on my finger and then it's all blurry now. So it's sort of an M-shaped box. Um, (laughs) But it it was supposed to be an M. Um, But because there was part of me that was like, I don't ever want to take that off. Like I want it there all the time. I want that to just like forever be part of me whether the ring falls off in a river or not. But I also like the shiny little signifier there. Like, I don't wear a lot of rings, but like, I like that one. It's got like a divot in my finger. Like, it's kind of cool. I've got a permanent tan line there. <laughs> but it points to, you know, the wear and tear even on my hand from it. Points to my marriage that, you know, 18 years coming up next month is fun. but there's a whole life that we live that has nothing to do with whether or not this circle is on my finger. So let's get back into this and talk through these signs that Jesus, this sign that Jesus offered up. It has more significance to us as we explore this because uh, if you've been to a a wedding in the United States, um, it probably looked nothing like a first century Jewish wedding. Um, And some of these things, we might read it and go, I didn't want that anyway. So let's talk through it. First couple of verses here. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. It's a weird little setup. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place. Third day from what, you might ask. Well, if you were reading the last part with us from last week, It gives us a bunch of, it says multiple times, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. And the last one we get is, then the next day, in verse 43 of chapter 1, it says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. It doesn't say where exactly he found him. It doesn't, so it might be that he goes, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And by the way, he's down just above the Dead Sea in um, uh, uh, next to the Jordan River where he'd been baptized. Like, that's the last location we've been given. John's baptizing at the Jordan River just outside of Jerusalem and, and all of that, and it's sort of down the hill, down at the Jordan River. And, and so he, he, he's over here, he's doing baptisms near Jerusalem, so like near the top edge of the Dead Sea, but not right at it. And Jesus is there, and he's been baptized there, and he's assumedly in the wilderness off to the side of that, and then comes back, and then John sees him again, and he goes, look, there, the lamb who takes away the sins, the, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And everyone's like, oh, oh. And some of his disciples start following. That's uh, one of them's Andrew, and he goes and gets Peter, and then, and then uh, Jesus from that location says, I'm going to go to Galilee. Galilee is like almost 80 miles north, is that like, and you're on foot. On dirt roads, like, that's going to take a minute to get there. At some point between saying, I'm going to Galilee and arriving in Galilee, he finds Philip, says, follow me. Might have been on the road, might have been partway there, I don't know. Jesus knew. And then Philip goes and finds Nathaniel, and he's like, I found the Messiah, you should come with us. And Jesus then, you know, speaks to Nathaniel and everything. Nathaniel, it says, is from... Bethsaida, right here. Philip, like, or, uh, Philip is from Bethsaida. It says, uh, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him. And uh, later in John 21, I believe, it says that um, Nathanael's from Cana. And so, anyway, all that to say, at some point or other, all these guys are from this area, and these are a bunch of little small towns next to each other. And... Um, And at some point, they're around, they end up in Galilee, in Cana, which is right next to the Sea of Galilee, a couple miles away. And and they're invited to a wedding. Jesus' mother is there, which Nazareth is about, um, best we can figure, it's about nine miles north of Cana. Um, There's two different cities that sort of have a name. It sounds like Cana. One of them is Cana, and the other one is like Kenna or something. 
And they're like, mm, it's probably not that one. It's this. Um, and Cana is the, it comes from the Hebrew word for reeds. And there's a uh, place where there's a lot of reeds near the more likely site for Cana anyway. And so it makes a little more sense that that's the spot. I don't know if you care about the geography of Israel at all or not, but I think when we can put things in a physical location and recognize like, hey, that's a real spot. Like you can go over there and walk around at it. That helps. Like that helps make it like these aren't just fairy tales talking about some far off place that you got to walk through a wardrobe to get through, you know, to get to. It's not some made up land that's invisible and, and taken away. This is real life. There's real places, real people that did these things. But also the context of these things in real life. What does it look like when the God who created the universe steps into the world he created and it's not really sure what to do with him? Because he does, says and does weird things. He says and does God things. And the world goes, oh, that's strange. Usually the stuff that's next to me here doesn't act like it created me. And, and it makes everything a little odd. But so they're up there. And then if they, I think, this is just trying to understand what it says here. I think they got there and then they're there for a couple of days. On the third day after they arrive, um, the wedding took place in Cana. That would make, to me, it makes more sense how Jesus and his disciples end up invited to this wedding. They get there, they're encountering friends and everything, and one of their friends goes, hey, I'm getting married day after tomorrow, you should come. And he, he goes, yeah, sure, I have like 12 guys with me, is that cool? They're like, yeah, sure, we'll figure that out. Come on, everyone's invited. And now you get to come. There's a lot more cultural context for that. Uh, but the fact that Jesus' mother was invited and it gives her precedence, there was a wedding, and Jesus' mother was there, and also Jesus and his disciples. Order like that sort of makes sense. Probably a family friend if Jesus' mother was invited, and then also Jesus and his disciples get to come along. Also, like half the disciples are from this region, so likely that a lot of them know each other. If you've seen The Chosen, this is one of the scenes that they do a pretty good job with. Um, some of them, I think, are a little more questionable, but this part was pretty good. Um, and they... Uh, they show kind of some of this cultural stuff. I don't know about the whole, like, I think it was, uh, I, I can't remember which disciple in the show. They make him like one of the wine people, and it's like all about his reputation and his family and all this stuff. I'm like, I don't know about any of that. Um, that's all possible, given the culture, but not, not in the scripture. So we, we don't want to read too much into what they wrote for interest. It made for great TV. Um, but... And it's possible, but uh, the things that are accurate are the, the fear that goes into the wedding party when they realize they're out of wine. Um, it would be a big deal. Now, again, some of us, if you've been raised in American churches, uh, there's a good chance that wine at a wedding would be like a huge no-no. Like, no, you can't do that. Um, uh, when I got married, we got married at an Assemblies of God church and had the, uh, the reception there as well, and there were zero, zero alcohol allowed anywhere near there. Um, there was absolutely nothing. Um, and that was somewhat intentional. <laughs> like, hey, oh no, you can't be drunk at my wedding? Weird. That's too bad. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there were, you know, some weird comments made about like, well, I don't know if I'm going to come because we can't drink. Like, that's a weird choice to make, but you do you. Um, <laughs> I guess we don't need to buy you dinner if that's more important. Um, but this would be a major deal. A wedding back then wasn't just like a couple hours on a Saturday. You know, here you plan the wedding, you go to the wedding, and it's like, oh, the wedding's at four. You know, like, okay, well, we'll probably be home by nine, you know? And that's if we go to the whole reception and stick around until they like drive away in the car. Uh, this, they didn't do any of that. They probably hosted at the groom's parents' house. They have the ceremony, and then at some point, the groom and the bride, they go and do newly married people things, and there's a huge feast and a party that goes on for days on end. I mean, it is like a whole week festival celebrating the, the wedding, and then, you know, at various times, the, the bride and groom are around, and, and they're part of the party and festivities as well, but this would be like a big deal. Now, imagine that, like, you know, any of you, like, for 
for me, for my family. Um, there have been times where, you know, like this last year, I got to go with my dad's side of the family to our Thanksgiving hangout, and it was days on end. We, you know, got a big house for everybody to come stay in, and, and we're having these big events. And there were moments where it's like, okay, well, we made two turkeys, and we're out of turkey, you know, because everybody's eating lots of turkey. And then the next day, people are trying to have leftovers, and all of a sudden, there's no turkey left. And so they're going like, we don't really have any other lunch plans. <laughs> like, what are we going to do? I guess we're sending somebody to the store for some PBJ, you know? We're going to figure this out, but we're out of, out of turkey already, or we're out of this. You know, things run out. And over a couple of days. Now imagine all of a sudden, you know, you have this family event planned, and you're planning this thing, but you bring along 13 extra people that you weren't planning on. A couple days in, makes sense how the wine started running out. And this was, there are some clues here that tell us, like, it was, it was real actual wine, too. Um, not, uh, I found, uh, looking at commentaries and stuff, just to get some of the cultural stuff right, and, like, the acrobatics required to try and, like, prove that there was no alcohol in this, and, like, you can't prove that Jesus served alcoholic wine. Like, I mean, you kind of can, but also it doesn't make any sense for him not to, um, especially given the, the master of ceremonies, uh, the master of the banquets comments, he's like, usually you wait till everybody's a little drunk and then you bring out the weak garbage stuff. And, you know, like, because no one cares anymore. And because their like, eh, palate's kind of done, you know, they've eaten enough food. They're like, eh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, this is fine. It looks like it's lighter. It's a rosé. Don't worry about it. It's just like watered down, like one to four. It's fine. And, um, and they would do stuff like that. You know, they weren't trying to get everybody toasted, but, uh, you know, they're having a good time. We'll say. And Jesus makes some wine that the guy tastes, and he's like, dude, you brought out like the real good stuff. All right, you know, the party's getting going again. And, and he made six stone jars with 30 gallons each. And it's six times 30, 180 gallons of really good wine. That's a lot of wine. Like that, that's a heck of a party to continue. That's um, kind of a big deal. So culturally, you're supposed to have this party going on and on and on, and the, there's a lot of impression, like a uh, reputation about all of this. And so it would be really important that you had all of this going. Jesus' mother comes to him, another implication that she probably knows the wedding party, she probably knows the family, because otherwise, what does she have to do with any of this? Not just Jesus going like, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with you? Well, how do you even know? She probably is a family friend. They have no more wine. She's starting to recognize that this is not, not going to go well. He says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus is not being rude. Real quick side note on understanding this. The word woman, it's the same term he uses from the cross in John. So the, John, the other time John uses this term referring from Jesus' mouth is when Jesus is on the cross and he looks at his mom and the disciple John and he goes, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. He kind of like adopts John into his family to take care of his mom because he's going away. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of respect. It's, it'd be closer to, you know, like in the South, like, ma'am, why, what, what is this? Why, why would you put this on me right now? It's, there's a soft rebuke in there, like, hey, it's not my time. But it's not a like, Lady, what are you doing? It's not that kind of thing. It's like, you know, like, woman, please. It's not that. Okay? So he is not chastising her in front of everybody. He's like, you know, honored woman, dear mother, why are you putting this on me right now? This isn't my time. There's another time when he, when he says, uh, my hour has not yet come. Um, later, it, John uses it in John 8. Uh, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees in the treasury of the temple. And, he, you know, uh, and uh, they're, they're like, hey, what authority do you have to do all of this? And, and he, he's like shooting back at them and kind of, you know, like really giving them some pretty sick burns. Like that time, he's definitely aggressively putting them down. And it says that they weren't able to, to arrest him because his time had not yet come. It's the same phrase there. So like he's saying like there is a time, there is a specific set of things that needs to happen. There are plans here, 
This isn't the moment where I'm supposed to be like, ta-da, it's me, come get me. Like, he has other stuff to do. He's got to establish a better thing. Right now, like, the disciples just started following him. They're still kind of being like, I don't know, I mean, he said a cool thing about Nathaniel sitting under a tree, but also, like, I mean, maybe he saw that when we were walking by. I don't know. And, you know, like, that wasn't that impressive a miracle. I don't really know who this guy is yet. John said he was the Lamb of, the, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but, I mean... What have we seen yet to really know? And if he gets crucified right then, it's sort of a like, oh, well, yeah, we'll find another Messiah. And, or we were wrong, thought he was cool, guess not. And yet, his mother says, well, do whatever he tells you, and walks away. She knows he's going to do it. There's some grace for his mother in that. There's some respect for this woman who is... Yeah, his mother deserves respect because of that, but also is a human. Doesn't quite get what's going on. And yet he's respectful and kind of pushing back and he still does the thing. He's like, my time's not come. Like, we're not making this a huge public thing. I'm just gonna do this and we're gonna have it happen. And she, she responds with, do whatever he tells you. As he performs this miracle, there's also a lot of grace and blessing for this family. There's some concern for the family, for this random moment of like whether or not their reputation is going to be okay as a married couple, whether or not the family is going to be able to hold decent standing in the community. It'd be a huge embarrassment and possibly a long-term stain on the family's reputation to have run out of wine and not be able to sustain the feast as planned. And Jesus has compassion on that and, and does this miracle in a way that gets things back on track. And in fact, and even more, because of the thing the master of ceremony said, like now it's this kind of huge blessing. Like now he's given this great honor to the bridegroom. And so like, it's just a small little thing, but um, there, there, were, there was a moment, I loved it when we were at our, um, at our dinner, and there was a moment of like people sharing some things that uh, we always leave kind of an open mic night at our potluck dinners. And so if you get the chance to come, please come and join us next time. Um, we'll do another one whenever the fifth Sunday happens is usually when we do them, uh, once a quarter. And we had an opportunity where people are sharing like, this is what God's been doing in my life. And one of the people shared, hey, I got this job opportunity opened up. And it had like nothing directly to do with Jesus. It's not like they're going into the ministry or anything. It was just like a random job opportunity. But it was just a really cool moment of like recognizing and attributing like a very mundane thing to God, which is appropriate, which is right. God is concerned with how you spend your life. God is concerned with what you're going to do when you're sitting around on the couch and what show you watch and, and how that affects your heart. As much as he's concerned with who you tell about him and how you share his faith and whether or not you have a relationship with him. And so it, in this too, I think there's just something of like, I mean, a wedding's just like a, a people thing. But, it, and, and there's no specific like, it's not like, and then they became great servants in the kingdom. There's like two unnamed people, random friends of Jesus' mom. But God took a moment to just make sure that that guy got honor. He cares. He cares about weird little things that are just between people. God's not impressed by whether or not the wine was good at that guy's wedding. Like, it wasn't a kingdom significant moment for that, except that the creator of the universe transmogrified wine into, or water into wine. And that's not how water works. So he's doing something significant there. But so Jesus says, uh, his mom says, do this. And so nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. There's a couple reasons why that might be said. One, it's just like a random detail. Um, but also like that water would be clean. It wouldn't be like gross standing water that was just like being collected out of the rain gutters. It would be, you know, the stone jars. They're not like clay jars that are gonna allow rot and that kind of thing or potentially uh, have mildew and stuff. It was a little more pure. And for ceremonial washing. So what they'd probably be doing is taking like a ladle or a, you know, big dipping bowl pot thing and they would scoop water out of that and then they would bring it to you and before before you eat, you would present your hands, and, and this isn't necessarily 
literally like soap and water kind of like bath time. It's a ceremonial thing to say like, I'm clean, and you pour the water on and you do a little, you know, kind of like Pilate when he's like, I have nothing to do with this guy. I wash my hands of this. He dips his hands in water and just like, it's a symbol. He didn't like cleanse his hands of the scum of having touched Jesus on the shoulder or something. He just, you know, like it's a symbolic, like I wash my hands of this, I'm out. This is off of me. And in the same way, like a ceremonial thing, at a wedding with all of these meals and courses going on for days on end, there were probably a bunch of times where you'd need all of those washings for you know, ceremonial cleanliness. So it's clean water. But they weren't full because probably the thing's been going. So this all takes a minute too. Like think about like 30 gallon jars. Like it took them a minute to fill all that up, right? So this miracle is going on while like the party's going like, hey, there's nothing to drink. You know, like things are dragging on a little bit. The party's starting to wind down. Like everyone's like, hey, are we, should we just like go to the sea and grab some water? Like what do you want to do here? Do you have a well? Like can we get some water? What? We're out of things to have with this party. It seems like it probably took a minute. They filled the jars to the brim. It doesn't say they just refilled one of them. It says they filled them to the brim at least a few minutes, if not you know, maybe a significant time. It doesn't tell us where they had to get the water from. But Jesus takes time in this miraculous transformation. But also... The ceremonial washing, um, there's something about the water and then the wine and then John having said, I'm baptizing with water, but here's one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be for the forgiveness of sin. It, like, it's going to be this more significant thing, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is going to move us from a, a ritual cleansing of water that externally cleans us to receiving the blood of Christ that brings forgiveness of sin. Like, there, there's just some hints, some signs there that just point at these other things that are really going on that Jesus is setting up. Not saying that ceremonial water, you just go like, oh, that's baptism. And everything about ceremonial washing in the Old Testament now is about baptism. That's like, don't take metaphors too far, but there's just little, little signposts you know, it's like the mileage marker on the side of the road. Reno, 32 miles. Oh, getting close. Something's coming. Rest stop ahead. All right. Salvation ahead. Okay. <laughs> Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. There's, there's an amazing moment of like these servants. Can you imagine being in the, point, in the place of these servants? Like you're just some guy who's like waiting tables at a wedding party. And all of a sudden, okay, come and... You know, put water in the glass, like, okay, sure. I'm going to go give him a nice cup of water. And bring it to him, like, it doesn't tell us when it changed. He brings a cup, and then at some point, it just, all of a sudden, it says, they did, draw some water out. It says, fill the jars with water. They filled them to the brim. Now draw some out, water. Take it to the master of the banquet. And so they bring him a goblet. And he tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Now it's wine. It doesn't tell us when that happened, but the servants know, I filled the jar with water. I put water from the jar in this cup. I gave it to that guy. Now he's bragging about how it's the best wine he's ever had. What? Who's the, hey, come back here with the like put water in the jar thing. Who's that guy? Like he doesn't even really tell them who he is. Like they might know because, you know, apparently a friend of the family, but like, hey, what Mary's son just, I don't know what's happening here. You know, like there's, there's a bit of a, a miraculous kind of side blessing to these people to just participate in a miracle just by being obedient with a very mundane thing. And there's something to be said about obedience when it doesn't necessarily make sense. But we know that God is calling us to it. And just simply following him in small things and seeing what God did... Because what did this miracle do? They're the ones who physically did the stuff. Jesus stood there and said, put water there. Put water in the cup. Take the cup to that guy. And now it's the best wine ever. Jesus stood there. 
See, he doesn't say he like played with the water or he spit in it or he jumped in or it, it doesn't tell it. He didn't like cut his hand and like squeeze. Like, it doesn't say anything. He just put water, take it to that guy. And now it's not water anymore. It's really good wine. There's something in this, like the servants have no idea what they're doing. They're not going into it like, guys, we're putting on the best show right now. Check this out. Check out how awesome all of this is going to be. And we've prayed and we've done all these things and we've prepped all this stuff. It's just like they're just being simply obedient to a very, very mundane task. And God is, this is the first sign through which Jesus reveals his glory to his disciples that they might believe in him. They got to, these random servants got to participate in that just by being faithful in a moment. There's, there's something to be said about just being faithful in small things and not, not always knowing what the bigger picture is, not always knowing what the, um, what the ultimate plan and how this is going to fit into that, but knowing that as God has commanded and as we are faithful to give glory to him in everything, that it, it's part of life in Christ. It's part of this journey toward the Holy Spirit, to uh, eternity. And so, um, all of that, the, he, brings, he brings honor and praise to the uh, groom. He brings honor and praise to the family. He brings uh, honor and praise uh, to his mom he, and to um, the, these people. They, they receive the blessing of having been right up close to what God was doing. And it seems like even a bunch of them don't really know that Jesus was part of this. They don't recognize where that blessing came from necessarily. They don't say like, oh, and Jesus, he was here. He must be the Messiah because he made all this stuff happen. Like they probably talked about it afterward. The servants probably went like when the bridegroom's like, where did you guys come up with all this good wine? Like, uh, well, that guy, Jesus, that was here, he did this thing. And then everybody's going to start talking about it. And it says that a bunch of people started following him. And, and the next sign in John is going to be um, back, you know, related to Cana again. And so, um, so it seems like it, word probably started leaking out a little bit. But the point is not, wow, Jesus can turn water into wine. And so like next time I'm really thirsty for something more than wine, I'm just going to pour some tap water and start praying. Like that would be a silly Foolish thing to do that has nothing to do. You'd be missing the point entirely of this. Um, I heard a story of somebody who um, had read the, um, they were with, I think, college students, um, but they read the accounts of Jesus after the resurrection and the disciples were in a closed room and Jesus like suddenly appears, like he walked through the wall or something, or he just like shows up, you know, um, Jesus, the friendly ghost, but resurrected human in flesh. I don't know. Um, but just all of a sudden, Jesus appears there in front of them. It doesn't say he like knocked on the door. He just like is in the locked room. And they were like, in Jesus, resurrection power, we can walk through walls. And they started running at the walls like they were in a Harry Potter movie trying to like run through <laughs> station nine and three quarters. Like, no, that was not the point of that story. You, that is not what's supposed to happen here. You don't have magical like wall pass through powers you don't get like a special wall pass to, you know, clear through solid objects. That, that wasn't the purpose. The point of this is not to turn water into wine. It's not to come up with crazy miracles so that you can be flashy. Instead, that point's just to reveal. It's a sign that reveals Christ. The whole point of this, the whole point of this gospel, the whole point of our lives in Christ is to know him and also along with that, to have signs and things that point to Christ. With that mentality, though, imagine what we might see if we were just open to all things pointing to Christ all the time. What types of things? Not how crazy miracle could we claim if we just name and claim it properly or we come up with the right formula or whatever else, but if we just trusted that all things in my life are meant to point toward Jesus, to draw me closer to him and to show others that he is Lord of all of creation. Imagine what could happen 
if we treated our lives that way, if we pursued our lives in that way. And then we wouldn't be ever people who, like the Pharisees in Matthew 12, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The signs are not the destination. The signs point the way to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. The signs point us to Jesus. The best sign that he could offer them when they asked for one was, I'm gonna be buried and come back. You tear this down and I will bring it back. The greatest miracle that we are likely to see in our lives is to receive the truth and power of that resurrection. Not in some sort of miraculous, like, you know, walk into the graveyard and start calling people out. But in a very realistic, the resurrection making a difference in my life because I serve and know the living God who died for my sins and came back to life, physically rose from the dead to guarantee eternal life for all who place faith in him. That is a significant miracle, the life transformation. I have seen miraculous things happen. I've seen things that I can go through the list of spiritual gifts in in 1 Corinthians 12, and I can point to moments that I have experienced in real life that I've seen so many of these spiritual gifts, these miraculous things actually happen. I've seen healings. I have seen prophecy. I have seen words of knowledge. I have spoken words of knowledge. I've seen so much cool stuff but my life has been transformed. And that is a better sign of the glory and power of Christ than anything that I've seen. All of those little things were cool, but they don't match the glory of watching a life be transformed. They don't match the glory of knowing that somebody's name is now written in heaven. What signs have you seen in your life? Maybe it's something amazing and flourishy. Maybe it's just, I didn't know him, but now I do. I was living for myself, and now I live for Jesus. Maybe it was, I have been faithful to him my whole life, and I've never known anything but following the Lord. A sign of resistance to the world, of life breaking through darkness all around me. It all points to Jesus is Lord. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ.